Hi there, this is Jonathan Nittuck from Procep Associates. In this video, we're going to talk about data modeling. So data modeling is BAPOC section 10.15. It's not a new technique. It's certainly been around for a while. And in this video, we're not going to give sort of an introduction to data modeling. We're going to talk more about how is data modeling relevant to you as a business analyst and how can you determine uh, some data model effects based on some other models that you might be working with. So this is definitely something a little bit more practical. So as I said, we're trying to do something practical here. We're not going to take a long time to talk about these things, just to mention very briefly. Data modeling, it's really about you know relational databases. How are they structured? Uh, how are they created? And the elements of those relational databases are entities. Those are the things that we're, that we're recording. Sometimes you'll hear them called objects. Some people call them tables. Uh, these are the, the things that we're dealing with in our domain. Attributes, you know, each entity can have multiple attributes. So these are the, the fields or the columns. Uh, sometimes we hear the word property, right? These all apply to uh, attributes or synonyms for attributes. They could be text, they could be numbers, even they could be images, you know, all these different uh, dates and data types that we might encounter. And then finally, relationships. So how are the entities related to one another? One, you know, one entity to many, many to many, one to one, you know, all of these type of relationships that we might encounter. So as I said, there's a lot of great videos talking about uh, data modeling, that's not what this data, this uh, video is about. Go ahead and take a look at one of those if you need some introductory information. This video is about data modeling for a business analyst. The first thing to talk about with data modeling is actually just a big warning, right? Data modeling is a skills gap uh, really across the board that you can encounter as a business analyst. So it's important for you to kind of understand this and, and be aware of it. So the first place that we see a skills gap in terms of data modeling is actually developers. So some developers, and these are fantastic developers, I'm, I'm not here to, uh, to give anybody a hard time, you know, fantastic procedural developers, right, sometimes can have a challenge with data modeling because um, data modeling is not, you know, flowchart based, right, it's, it's a static model, it's describing, you know, data and how it's related. It's a different kind of thinking than you know being procedural. Do this, do this, do this, and so on, and looping, and all those things that maybe a developer is more used to, kind of thinking in that way. Uh, so it's not flowchart based. It comes from a different branch of mathematics. So it comes from set theory and sets inside of sets and relating sets and all of those kind of things. Um, and again, that's not kind of a branch of mathematics that a lot of us you know explore and spend a lot of time in you know, after we leave high school. Uh, we tend to be more procedurally focused and certainly true for our developers as well. So different branch of math. Also, unfortunately for us as business analysts, you know, our, our de developers may, might not be very strong in this. Our business stakeholders also can have a challenge with this. Um, can be difficult for them to understand, again, because they think procedurally, right? Process-wise, you know, I do this, then I do this, then I do this, and then I do this. Uh, they're not thinking about those entities and, and relationships so much. Uh, and the other big factor that influences the business stakeholders is the use of spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are the number one go-to tool for most business stakeholders in terms of creating and managing data, but they are two-dimensional, right? There's only two dimensions in a spreadsheet. And as a result, uh, that can lead to a little bit of two-dimensional thinking. Uh, relational database is a lot more dimensions than that. So that can also create a challenge in terms of uh, business stakeholders being able to understand a data model and especially to, let's say, visualize. It's, it's much more difficult. They're used to rows and columns. They can kind of see that. But when you start talking about different tables and how these things relate, it's, it's not necessarily easy for them to do. So uh, this is a big challenge for business analysts. You've got two key groups here that are not going to be necessarily strong in this area. And at the same time, getting that data model correct, getting it right, is critical to your solution. Uh, if you are familiar with this, and if you have worked in this area, you know that a poorly designed database or a poor data model 
will lead to just a very poor performing solution in the long run. So getting this data model correct, bad news here, uh, tough to do in terms of the support and people that you have, but critical that you get it right. So the next thing I want to talk about is how data models relate to other models that you might have created as part of your solution. And the first example I want to look at is how a data model might relate to a process diagram. So we have a very simple process diagram here, um, BPMN notation, three kind of steps in our process. Oftentimes what we'll have is there's a data entity, a transactional kind of data entity that is following through that process, that every time we take a step in the process, the state or status of a particular data entity might change. So in this case, it's an example from human resources, you know, a candidate application, as it's going through that process, the state of the application might change. Uh, this tells us where that transaction is within the process. So that's a very common thing that, that we might see. If we look a little bit closer at this process diagram, we'll see one very subtle thing here, which is that third step actually says check references with a plural, right? So there's more than one reference per candidate. So while the candidate application might be a record that's going through this process and changing states as it goes through the process, when we get to you know check references, now we have a different situation because we have multiple, or we have the potential for, multiple reference records per candidate application. So if I was to draw that as a entity relationship diagram, what you can see here is that we actually have two entities, one for the application and one for the reference, and they each have their own state. So the state of the overall uh, application might be checking references, but the reference themselves can have a complete separate life cycle of states in that uh, you know, maybe we requested the contact information for the reference, we've you know, made our first attempt to reach them and are waiting to hear back, or you know, we've heard back and we're confirming information, or whatever the, the life cycle of a reference check is going to be, it's actually uh, an independent life cycle to, to the application. And, and more importantly, you know, we see that relationship, the one application to many references, that there could be multiple references associated with one application. So, this is very subtle, but very important. That all we see on the process diagram is the letter S, right? If it said check reference, then there would be no separate table, there would be no separate entity, and the reference check, singular, would be part of the application record. Because it says references in plural, it, it, it's a clue, it's an indication that there are actually multiple records and that there should be a relationship between those two different types of data. So this is a good example of uh, how a process model can drive uh, data in terms of helping us to define and understand our entities. So as a business analyst, think about and watch for cases where uh, a plurality has occurred, right? That instead of, we're not just following one thing anymore, but now we have more than one, that is likely an indication that there should be a new data relationship and a new entity in, so that those multiples, uh, instances, whatever they are, can be created and associated with the one parent object. So, example of process flows uh, allowing us to understand our data models a little bit better. The next examples we're going to look at all relate to prototypes. So in this case, uh, this is a little prototype wireframe of, let's say, an order entry system, right? We're going to create an order for, for a customer. Uh, we're going to have a little drop-down box that allows us to select that customer. And then below that, we see some fields for the address, the city, all that type of information. And those fields are read-only, right? So we select the customer, and the, the fields for delivery are read-only. Well, what kind of implications would this have for our data model? Well, our data model would probably look like this. So we have the, the sales order entity, which has you know, a customer as, as a form key. You can see the relationship there. And the address information are attributes or properties of the customer. They are not properties of the order. So if the customer you know, changes address, then it's going to change the address on, on all of the orders, right? Uh, so that's an important thing to, to understand. I, I worked at an organization that was uh, 
uh, distributing consumer packaged goods to various uh, retail locations in the country and you know we had a rule if you change the address it, you know that was a new customer right because our, our we were focused on retail stores you know stores don't really move they it, an old it, they're tied to the location so when a store closes uh, if it's moving it's closing and opening a new one uh, so we might have had a data model like this where the address information was only a property of the customer record and not a property of the sales order. It means that every order that goes to that customer must go to the same address. We're going to look at kind of a opposite example here. So here, uh, same situation, we have a mock-up of an order entry screen, we pick our customer, and then now we have read-write fields, right? So we can adjust the address, we can adjust, adjust the city and postal code and so on. Uh, we might still be populating them from the customer's address, but we have the potential to make a delivery to an address other than the address that we have on file for that customer. Well, what would that look like in terms of a data model? Uh, you can see here, you know, a big difference our sales order entity actually has attributes for you know delivery address delivery city and so on um, we need that this means that you know different orders for the same customer can go to different addresses so uh, one thing to be clear is you know uh, looking at these two designs or two scenarios you know one is not better than the other it's a matter of understanding what matters to your solution and what's important for your solution. Uh, in, in my case and story where we were uh, delivering to these various stores, you know, we didn't really want uh, people who were creating orders to be mucking around with the address and change the address, right? A change of address was a major event that affected the entire customer record. Uh, and those retail locations were not allowed to order products to be delivered to some kind of alternate address, right? So that first data model was the correct model in that case. Uh, but not necessarily in other cases. So uh, really a matter of understanding what your customer or your, uh, I should say your stakeholder, really a matter of understanding what your stakeholder's requirements are. Uh, but very interesting how the prototype drives us to a better and stronger understanding of the data model. So we have a couple more examples here of uh, different prototypes. I'm going to stick with this uh, order management kind of idea. So here we have a mock-up. You know, we're going to select our, our customer. Uh, and then we have a selection for uh, promotion. And below that, we have, you know, a table, right? So there's a, there's a table. Well, when you see that, you know, uh, one record at the top, multiple records down below, that automatically should indicate to you there's two different types of data here, right? So we have the sales order data and then we might have you know another entity for the sales order details they're describing the products and quantities that were purchased uh, so anytime you see that physical arrangement of you know one record with some information and then you know rows or a table of, of information below there's always going to be that parent child relationship in the database uh, or in the data model uh, also what we see here is you know the promotion is applied to the entire order right so this order I'm applying you know the Black Friday uh, promotion to the order uh, look at our next example we're gonna see an alternate possibility now you'll see that the promo code is actually a column in the table which means the promo can actually be applied different promotions uh, can be applied to a single order they're actually applied to you know the sales order detail lines um, uh, like what's the implications of this? It means that you know one product can only have one promotion, right? You can either have Black Friday or you can have BOGO or or you can have the volume discount or whatever, uh, but you can't have more than one. We could have a you know a different system again if we had different requirements where the promotions are actually children of the order lines themselves um, or the sales order details so you could have you know well it's Black Friday and it's BOGO and you get 10% off and you're a club member for another 5% and these things could actually all contribute and add up so understanding you know where those promotions are applied again is really a data modeling question but we can see the answer to that question in the prototype you know where does it appear if it appears in the top then it's a property of that parent record at the top. If it appears in the rows, then it's a property of uh, those the records that that represents or the entities that that represents. If somebody were to come along and say, well, I want to put more than one thing in that column, then you should clue in again. Oh, that means they're actually children of these rows. 
So we can see very easily, or if we, if we know what we're looking for, you can see the data relationships represented in the prototypes that you've created. So this is a great way to elicit uh, data model information from stakeholders, because as I mentioned, it can be a difficult topic for them. It, it's not easy for them necessarily to read an entity relationship diagram, but if you give them a prototype you know, and ask them some smart questions, they will be able to answer all of those questions about what their true data requirements are. Thanks very much for your time. This has been Jonathan Nintuck with ProSep Associates. If you have any questions about this content or other training or courses that we have to offer, please check out our website. Thank you.